Welcome to the last panel. My name is Shelby Doyle, the 2023 Acadia President and an Associate Professor of Architecture at Iowa State University. So welcome to the Habits of the Anthropocene epilogue uh, panel titled Technology, Knowledge, and Culture Toward an Equitable Architecture. I'm pleased to introduce Simone Nikhil, Emmer, Ken Geyser, and Chris Cornelius, and they will each share their work and stories from their practices that I think will help us reconsider what we consider knowledge in both architecture and computational design. Simone C. Nikhil is a designer and researcher based in Amsterdam. Her practice, TechnoFlush Studio, investigates the representation of identity and the digitization of biomass in the network space of appearance. Her work has been exhibited internationally, most recently at, oh goodness. I didn't say that. A long German name, Kunst. <laughs> Photo Museum, Winterher, La Get Lyrique, and she has published writing and volume magazine, AD Architecture and EFLUX. She is Chief Information Officer at Design Academy Eindhoven. In 2016, she was research fellow at Et Nuit Institute Rotterdam and is commissioned contributor to the Dutch Pavilion at the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennale. Nikhil is a recipient of the PAX Art Award 2020 and a 2021 Mellon to 2023 Mellon researcher at the Canadian Center for Architecture. Currently, she is investigating the architectural and bodily consequences of computer vision, researching the politics of synthetic training and data sets. Please join me in welcoming Simone Nikhil. Well, hello, thanks for having me. Um, hopefully not everyone is too exhausted, but we'll get through it. Um, so, you know, in some ways I feel like a guest, an intruder, there's different words um, to a conference such as this. I'm trained as a graphic designer um, and a photographer, but somehow, you know, find myself between disciplines and one of them is architecture. Um, Oh, this one is delayed. I get it. Okay, so what we'll talk about today um, is a project that started around 2018, and it's called um, Model Home, which is sort of the larger chapter. So most of the work I do is either in writing essays um, as well as film. There's not enough time um, to show the films today, but if you're interested, just come and ask me after. And what I want to talk about is um, a lot of the, the background um, research information that goes into making these um, 3D animated movies. Um, they deal with um, computational seeing, so computer vision. And what I'm interested in is it was... Um, a direct departure from work I was doing on face recognition. And with face recognition, I realized that I kept on, um, you know, one of the main questions to me was from a queer perspective, how is uh, computer vision used as a way to being read, right? Like you're a coded body. How do you want to be read? Is this actually the way you sh sh want to be perceived? Um, and of course, tons of sort of privacy questions that are embedded um, in surveillance, in wanting to represent a certain way, um, but there also being this idea of control in um, also accuracy, as we've just heard, in being able to really identify you as you versus someone else. Some of that is common sense, and I think this is something that um, we'll see in the presentation sort of come back. So face recognition work um, has made me make a decision to look at architecture, specifically the domestic space for several reasons. And one was um, wanting to understand, not just comment on the technology, but understand how does it actually work. Um, and from a human perspective, less from a technical perspective. And that led me um, to looking at training data sets. And one of the reasons is that um, domestic spaces, I mean, how do you access them, right? How do you gather enough images, visual material of what a domestic space is like um, to train a computer vision model to sort of say, well, this is how people live. I think that's one central question um, of this research. And the other was that there was no human body, right? There was no representation of the human figure. It was always implied either in the furniture or in the spaces 
And that was very freeing. I didn't have to like reproduce my own critique as in like, why do we keep on distributing people's faces? We don't know why are, you know, Facebook databases, profiles scraped um, for research purposes, which in some way to just talk about that, I was doing the same thing. Um, and so I think the domestic space became a really important um, site for this research. So computer vision essentially is pattern recognition. Um, this paper from 1955, I think has this really beautiful um, way of talking about this where as a human being, as someone that speaks English, you read this as the cat, even though the H and the A are similar, or are the similar figure, you complete them in your mind through common sense and through the knowledge that you possess in a way that you can just read it as a cat. Um, for a computer vision model, that is not such a thing. Um, an image like this, again, I think is interpreted in a certain way. We find it funny. Um, it's a shark. Is it a cow? Is it the milk a cow? It's purple. Running it through different um, computer vision models also means that it, it's seen in a different way. So on the one hand, there's a model called ResNet 101, and it sees different kinds of fish. And then there's BagNet, and it sees different, the sorrel is a type of grass, so predom predominantly looks at the grass. And the others are types of, um, well, brown furred animals, so either dogs or a gazelle or an ox. And what it turns out to be is that on the one hand, you look at shape and on the other, at texture. And that, so the way a model is trained deeply defines on what it sees or how it interpret. I mean, we're using these human words to talk about technology. That doesn't really make sense, but we somehow have to communicate and, you know, try and figure out um, how these AI models um, function. Again, I think there's always a certain absurdity and humor in my work um, to make it accessible, but at the same time, it becomes quite drastic quite quickly. So sure, there's a shark. What does it mean if in a domestic space um, you have a couch that looks like a cow? Could also still be funny. Um, becomes less humorful pretty quickly when, again, there's people involved and there's always people involved in a domestic space. Um, this article from 2015, which has a really sensational headline as right, this robot is suddenly eating um, this woman's hair. It certainly not doesn't have any agency. It's a Roomba, a self-cleaning robot. Um, in 2015, the Roombas didn't have computer vision. They worked on infrared sensors, so they were just looking at distance. But I think there are certain um, parameters built into how the robot operates that are assumptions by whomever has created this thing, right? At what point of day does it clean, which is based on a, like a nine to five schedule. Um, now you can define this yourself in the app, but we're talking a bunch of years ago. At the same time was a bed, right? Sleeping on the floor, sleeping on a futon is not the way you sleep. Obviously a bed is like a raised sort of Western uh, piece of furniture. So there's all of these sort of ideas of not just common sense, but also again, what do the design spaces um, look like and who's defining them to these automated systems? And I mean, again, sort of, domestic spaces. I think some of this is speculative. Some of these products already exist. Um, some might be in your own houses. Some, you know, might never exist. Boston Dynamics really wanted to have the Spot Mini in 2018, at least, as something that would sort of cohabitate with you. Now we've seen it become a completely different animal, which is used by, uh, well, to surveil public spaces. But what they all have in common is that they do have a camera. And the thing I want to talk about is the camera, less the object. I think the object um, always kind of sensationalizes uh, computer vision and puts it into sort of sign, well, science fiction space of like a robot. Um, we need the robot so the camera can move through the space. But at the end of the day, um, the robot also needs the camera to navigate. And that relationship is the important one. So one sort of, you know, thing um, we can talk about today is, at least for me, this idea that computation is the new optics. So that as Kodak sort of wanted to have in uh, the 50s and the 60s, right, there's not so much a point of capture anymore. Um, there's, I think for the iPhone, there's one trillion processes that happen once you actually take a photo before the image appears. Um, so computational photography is in smartphones. Um, but it's a different idea of capture. So optics and this idea of a camera seeing um, has dramatically changed technology and the ways of seeing. 
So machine learning is a clean mathematical apparatus that gives the status quo the aura of logical inevitability. The numbers don't lie. And this is a quote from an article um, that was looking at the way face recognition and computer vision technologies were used in the hiring process so that um, you would pre-screen candidates uh, before you would have human to human interviews um, to figure out if they would be a right fit. And this is, for me at least, this quote is directly what I would sort of attack with the research I'm doing. Like, is this actually a logical invitability? Perhaps, um, but to what ends? And in in what what is actually the question um, you want to uh, direct computer vision to? And so this directly leads me to synthetic data. Um, synthetic data is the types of data that's used um, to train computer vision in at least a domestic sense. Um, I think one reason being that there simply aren't enough 2D, so there aren't enough photos um, of domestic spaces. And um, who I'm talking about here are you know, computer engineers um, that have probably most often not spoken to any designer um, or a philosopher that similarly have addressed these questions, right? So all of this research happens in sort of a vacuum of solving a computer scientist's uh, question, which is creating an algorithm or creating a computer vision um, model that can recognize certain objects. But what those objects are, aren't necessarily questioned. And I think as we've seen over these three days, they definitely are. They're just happening in a different discipline um, than the ones here. And there's a lack of connection oftentimes um, between these different research endeavors. So synthetic data is gathered um, to generate. And what I mean is like there's 3D floor plans and there's uh, furniture, accessories, et cetera. And they're um, automatically generating, um, well, architectural spaces having cameras on um, sort of pre-calculated trajectories, sort of like paths through these 3D spaces. Um, and the videos that they generate, that then becomes the training data. So ultimately it's still about a 2D image, um, but it's frames extracted from rendered videos. And here we're looking specifically at one of these data sets, which is produced by the Dyson Robotics Lab at Imperial College in London. Um, Dyson from the Dyson vacuum cleaners. And um, this one is called CNET RGBD. And what I was interested in is, okay, but then what is this architectural space, right? How do you define it? And you again, being um, computer engineers, and they were really specific in having categories um, of rooms, one being, you know, bedrooms, office scenes, kitchens, living rooms, and bathrooms. Again, I think there's a huge assumption that everyone lives like that. Um, there's definitely very different um, living arrangements. Like I don't have an office scene. Um, and at the same time, there's also very strict lists of the categories of objects that would be placed in these uh, different kinds of room types. Um, I've just highlighted a few here that stand out. Um, some we can agree on something like a chair and a lamp seems pretty um, straightforward and mundane, but then media player, iPod, like why is the iPod not a media player? Um, on the other hand, there's gun and sword and toy. Like, are we talking about weapons? Are we talking about a toy? Um, again, I think there's all kinds of questions that basically become, they, they're being treated logically as a category. Um, and the deeper meaning behind them is completely lost. There's no context to any of these categories. And so for example, taking, um, this is uh, still out of one of the uh, movies. Taking this object of the gun, right, rendering it as a depth image, um, which we've seen in some of the other presentations, depth images would just, it's a representation of the distance from a virtual camera to, well, whatever is in the background receding. So the black here is the darkest, the furthest away from the virtual camera, and the light is the closest. So you're not really seeing a gun, you're just seeing distances, and the distance reveals the object. But then rendering it in a different way of seeing, um, you know, you can reveal the different kind of textures. So in this case, it is a plastic um, gun, but of course, this could be completely different. And so again, looking at um, what information is contained within an image, um, what sort of context is missing or can be added, and also what are the um, implications of such. Um, one more look at the CNET RGBD data sets. Um, I was particularly intrigued by the image that is circled in yellow. What we're looking at is different kinds of office scenes. Um, the top right image 
also has this thing called a projection space. So that it would have media places or like TVs. Um, and these spaces automatically get textured. And I was particularly struck by this one. Um, looking in the folders, because the data set is a set of folders um, that you can open in your finder. There's two images in projection spaces, so two textures that you can use to apply to these um, media surfaces. And both of them are from Fox News, which I, you know, normally speaking in Europe, I have to introduce what Fox News is. Here I don't. Um, but you know, there's again, there's a sort of question of is that an assumption? Is that an intention? Probably it's just, you know, happenstance. Like I have to, I being again, um, just someone doing this job, um, I have to find um textures, images that represent media, TV. Well, maybe I have my Facebook open, I put it in there. I don't think there's so many deep reflections, probably, um, in how these data sets are assembled. But one of my main questions is there isn't so much annotation on how this happens, right? Why actually are there two Fox News images in there? There's no documentation of the process. Um, similarly here, we're speaking to one of the um, scientists from, from CNET RGBT, which is one of the things I tried to do, you know, getting get in sort of contact, um, which normally they're kind of confused, like, why do you want to talk to me? Um, and I think for me, that's really important because obviously there's always people involved in making things um, and speaking to them about their work reveals a lot about their intentions, um, about the way they've made things, maybe what they sort of want the thing to end up with, the context and the applications. And so this um, specific case was interesting because they were like very frustrated how there were mailboxes in all of these rooms. You know, they were like mailboxes are supposed to be outside of the house. They shouldn't be inside. Um, and it just happened that in the way the mailbox was categorized, right, it was a box. So like a box is like a mundane object could be in any op in, in any room. Um, but it ended up just being um, that there's also mailboxes in these boxes. So, I mean, it wasn't like a technical mistake, right? It was just the way um, that these files were sorted in the folders. So again, a um, still from the video with tons of mailboxes inside. Um, so again, I mean, now we're um, in an you know, architectural context, um, but similarly, linguistics has uh, tackled or at least tried to address some of these difficulties, um, one being this idea of fuzzy borders, right? So that a object always needs a context um, and the context defines the way it's named, the way it's seen. Um, something like where does the vase begin um, or where does the bowl end? Like where do these objects kind of meet? And there's always a spectrum. Um, computer vision training sets, at least for now, they can't, um, you know, there's no context to the data itself. So what happens, well, first this one. Um, so William Lobov, um, who's a linguist, in 1975 was, um, you know, for he had a specific data set and he had asked people um, with these objects, hey, if it's in a food context, if it's in a neutral context, is it now a cup? Is it a vase? If you put flowers in it, is your cup still a vase? If it has a handle, et cetera. Um, really sort of questioning what these, um, you know, industrial products mean to you as the user. And so he sort of decided, well, there is a calculation I can make, like there's a statistic. Um, but the point is, is that the statistics only applies to the exact data set that he has, right? It's not generalized. Whereas um, the computer vision researchers I've been talking to, they're aim really is to make something that's universal, right? Something that you can create an incubator and then scale um, on a global uh, level. And um, one more example for this data set is in the group chair, which again, feels like something you can kind of, um, you know, decide upon what a chair is, isn't so straightforward. Um, there's also these four objects among other ones um, that are more or less disturbing. And on the one hand, you know, there's, um, well, armchair, 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 straight chair, none of them are actually that. Um, again, I think there's humor, but there's also just very, you know, grave um, situations that are completely neg neglected and put without any context at all in a space that they're not supposed to be in. Um, so quoting Abeba Birhan, who um, is a, fantastic um, researcher, computational engineer, um, who's written a paper called The Impossibility of Automating Ambiguity. 
Um, through the practice of clustering, sorting, and predicting human behavior and action, these systems impose order, equilibrium, and stability to the active, fluid, messy, and unpredictable nature of human behavior and the social world at large. So, I mean, what I'm interested in, in what she's saying is, again, this, I think on the one hand scale, like you might create something for a very specific use case, but at the moment that you scale it, there's a certain absurdity or a certain um, violence that can appear. And at the same time, life is much messier than the logic um, that machine learning may or may not want to impose on it. And I think that doesn't mean that it should be scraped, right? But it's more, there should be an awareness, um, there should be an annotation, a documentation in how these tools are being put together, by whom. Um, and so some of these things I'm trying to tackle in a um, new research lab at the uh, Design Academy in Eindhoven titled Parametric Truth, which is a term that I've sort of you know, carried um, on through my practice, which is simply trying to look at um, sort of the very, you know, softwares that have become so standardized and normal in our practices, talking about like, um, as designers, for example, the Adobe suite, um, and just trying to like, just sit with it, right? Like, why does the button look a certain way? What do I expect um, the interface to do? Uh, if I do like, I don't know, if I use this one slider, um, why does it behave a certain way? Um, and not so much from a coding standpoint, but really just as someone using it um, and not just taking it as a given. And so really starting a dialogue again, not so much also saying no to things, but trying to find a position where you can make decisions again and not just sort of take tools um, for granted. And what it means specifically for the model home research is for me at least, you know, also making like a documentation of um, the training data sets that I found and trying to figure out how they correlate. So there might be like a new paper in 2021 um, with new data, but the data might actually uh, be siphoned from papers from 2017, 2019. Um, Simply, there isn't so much, uh, of course, there's references, um, but most of this I figured out by downloading the data sets and literally just going through it um, because they might be named newly, right? They're repackaged, um, whereas there isn't necessarily suddenly new 3D data. Um, a lot of this comes from game asset stores like Unreal. Most of it is um, from the SketchUp warehouse. So there's only a certain amount of data that is added to those. Um, so again, a, I think a documentation strategy um, is important here. And another way um, I've been interested in, you know, how do you interact as someone that makes, um, it's an implicit position, like I like to make things, um, but that also means that I'm using the tools I'm critiquing. Um, and so one thing I've been interested in as well is how do you, through the act of making, have sort of a research position? Can you test boundaries? Um, can you figure out how far tool works or isn't supposed to work um, if such a thing exists? And um, what I'm showing here is a new tool from Luma AI, which is text to 3D, so that you would insert a prompt and you get a 3D mesh back, um, which of course is just sort of ultimate idea for computer vision training that you could prompt data sets. Um, the thing here is that they have everything that people have prompted online. Um, so what you're looking at, I've just packaged them in these sort of fake, um, you know, action figure packages. But um, I've downloaded the figures. And so what you're looking at is the woman of my dreams and the man of my dreams. So that's someone's prompt. And what they get back are um, these two very wonderful sort of Netflixy um, personas. And at the same time, also the very simple character design of a normal man is a very specific typology of what a man is supposed to look like, right? So why is man that and not all of the other possibilities of the spectrum? Um, and I think some of that is very important seeing how, you know, practices are becoming much more digital, but also the players um, are to some extent um, a little bit undefined. I think NVIDIA is really important in how they're setting up a platform called Omniverse, um, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. Um, and they're really interested in sort of rebuilding, well, making everything accessible um, as a, as a 3D model for the purpose, of course, to be able to model. But I mean, it, there's similar um, limitations there in terms of um, you know what's available is actually what you're gonna be building with. So if you scale it up, that also means is everything gonna start looking the same? So, you know, scale is unlike variety. Um, I think to sort of repeat um, some of the, the 
the questions and thoughts, but I think there's, you know, sort of an impossibility at creating very general um, AI applications. Um, at the same time, I don't think scale is a way to solve diversity. I think um, at least in the research that I've been doing, you see that a lot where um, to create something that addresses more or different kinds, um, data sets are scaled up. But I mean, all of that has to come from somewhere. And if something's not documented, then it's still not going to be in there. And with that, of course, also comes the question of do we even want to be included? And you could be a person, um, but of course, could also be your environment, um, could be the things you do. Um, and so, you know, the questions are much more complex. Um, I think on the one hand, one of these things is that they probably should be addressed in a much more interdisciplinary way. And at least from the perspective that I have, um, a lot of the research happens in pockets, um, but they share research questions. Um, but there isn't so much of a dialogue oftentimes. And you know, some of these questions that might have been addressed by disciplines in different ways, um, but it isn't necessarily um, integrated into a um, larger practice. Thank you. Thank you, Simone, that was amazing. Um, next up is Chris Cornelius. Chris is a citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and professor and chair of the Department of Architecture at the University of New Mexico. He is the founding principal of Studio Indigenous, a design practice serving indigenous clients. He served as a cultural consultant and design collaborator with Antoine Pridak on the Indian Community School of Milwaukee. ICS won the AIA Design Excellence Award from the Committee on Architecture for Education. Cornelius holds a Master of Architecture degree from the University of Virginia and a Bachelor of Science in Architectural Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Cornelius was the spring 2020, 2021 Louis Kahn Visiting Assistant Professor at Yale University. He has previously taught at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and the University of Virginia. Chris is the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the inaugural Miller Prize from, the, from Exhibit Columbus, a 2018 and 2022 Architects Newspaper Best of Design Award, and an artist residency from the National Museum of the American Indian. Chris has been widely exhibited widely, including the 2018 Arch Venice Architecture Biennale and Studio Indigenous received a 2021 Architects Newspaper Best of Practice Award, Best Small Practice Midwest. Chris lives and works on the ancestral lands of the Pueblo, Tiwa, and Piero people. Please join me in welcoming Chris Cornelius. What kuf nuela do, Chris Nyongets, Akwahoni Wagita Loda. So I said in Oneida that I extend my greetings, love, and thankfulness to all of you. I am Chris Cornelius of the Wolf Clan, and people of the Standing Stone is the earth that I come from. Um, very happy to be here, and, uh, and thank you for, for the invitation um, to, to share my work. I've entitled my talk, Relatives. Um, it is a concept in Indigenous culture. Um, that all living things are related. And we speak of all of these things as our relatives, including stones. Stones are our grandfathers. Um, they're just living in a much longer timeline um, than, than we, we are as, as humans. And I think about um, both humans and, and non-humans um, in, in how we interact with one another and, and being good relatives with, with each other. So I started my practice in 2003 when I was asked to be a culture consultant and a collaborating designer with Antoine Predock on the Indian Community School of Milwaukee. Um, it is a K through eight private school. Um, students only have to prove native ancestry to, to attend the school. There's about 350 students um, that, that attend the school. The school purchased um, nearly 200 acres just southwest of Milwaukee in uh, Franklin, Wisconsin, um, and, and students come from metropolitan Milwaukee area to, to this place. But it's, it's, a, it's a place of community as well as, as a school. It was started by three mothers in the late 60s who were unhappy with how their um, students were, or as children were being taught history, uh, the history of this of this country. So one of the things that we did um, on the project and really sort of my primary role was to um, uh, in sort of uh, layer culture into into the architecture and translate culture uh, of the eleven tribes of Wisconsin that that are uh, attending the school, 
And so one of the things we did was to strip all of the institutional names from things in the school. For instance, they've never called the place that they eat the it, the cafeteria. It's called Feast. This is the student entrance. It's called Migration. Um, and school opened in 2007. Um, and they still call those things um, the same same names um, today. And so largely my role was embedding the the culture into into the architecture. Um, these these tree columns were harvested from the Menominee Nation in Wisconsin. Um, many of them are over 300 years old and they hold stories that are pre-European contact um, and they're inside the school to to begin to tell those stories. One of the images that I created early on in the project was this um, vertical graphic of everything from the site all the way up to the moon, uh, really understanding that when we're uh, creating architecture in a place, we're intervening in a system of reciprocities and, and how does how does the work interact in those um, in those reciprocities? And then what lessons can we learn from, from our non-human inhabitants? What lessons can we learn from animals that burrow into the earth? Uh, there's a depth of frost in that area of Wisconsin that's that's four feet. Um, what are uh, where are the animals, birds, uh, butterflies, bees, everything that is is migrating across uh, the air? Uh, where are the seasonal winds? Where does airline traffic happen? Uh, where where does space travel happen? Where are satellites? All the way up to the moon, uh, understanding that again that those are a series of reciprocities and that intervening into that system, we have a responsibility as the designers to understand that uh, and to begin to think about that relationship. This is an image that I did that we, we tr um, translated many cultural values into these into these graphics. And so one of the indigenous concepts I, I want to share with you that is really important in the in my work and, and the way that I see myself as a designer is this idea of relationality. In indigenous culture, we talk about things as if we are related to them. That's why we call the earth our mother, uh, the moon is our grandmother, the sky is our father, stones are our grandfathers. We almost mean that literally uh, in a very familial way and, um, and, and how those things are related. So again, our, our non-human relatives um, are also our relatives uh, and, and we think of them in that, in that manner. Um, and so in, in many indigenous cultures, not, not, not all, we've talked about plants as our oldest relatives, uh, meaning that some are food, some are medicine, they have seen good growing seasons, bad growing seasons and, and droughts. I do believe that we should be talking about buildings as our youngest relatives. Um, thinking about them as if we were related to them it changes the responsibilities that we have as the designers and when we're putting them into the world. Um, if we think about it, they're, they're, much, they're very much like children, right? Um, they produce waste, um, they consume a lot of resources, uh, they breathe, they sweat. Um, we need to think about, about those things in, in the ways that we're um, putting things into the world. And so for me, that, this is how I begin to think about, about architecture as if it was, uh, as if we're related to it. Um, it Early on in my career, too, shortly after the Indian Community School, I started to make these models and, and drawings, and I was trying to escape this uh, idea of design, as, especially for Indigenous people, as, as everything is a metaphor for something else, uh, but really thinking about things... Um, for instance, what if we weren't clear about who or what made this thing or designed it? Was it a human? Was it a non-human? Was it some other sort of phenomena? Was was it things that understood nature and weather uh, in ways that we couldn't as, as humans? I made them in these found boxes. I thought of the, the boxes as being similar to the architectural site, right? It has a history. Uh, it is confined. We can't make it bigger. We can't make it smaller. It has all these other contingencies. Um, and instead of making uh, humans as a scale figures, I started to put animals in them. Um, and in this, um, I'm not really answering the question of whether this, this deer is admiring this thing, has just happened upon this thing, has designed this thing. Um, all of those things are in the realm of, of possibility. And so some of these are like three-dimensional sketches. I was sort of building them as I was designing them. I cast these plaster landscapes for them um, and really started to think about what if I didn't tr try to make a thing as a metaphor for uh, another thing. Some of them started as drawings. Um, some of them really quick sketches like this one on the on the far left. I was thinking about what if cladding was like feathers, uh, I, if it interacted in that way in the middle. What if I started to play with the moray pattern of, of these mesh? And what if I had 
put a thing in a box that was intended to open and close, but it could never close again. Uh, and it was really just a seat to uh, see the moon uh, and begin to think about that. So it really started to, uh, I started to see this as, as a kind of almost athletic conditioning, uh, meaning that it was preparing me for the race. It was preparing me for the competition, uh, expanding uh, my ideas about, about architecture. And, and when I was teaching, um, I, I talked to students about that, that we're, we should be using all cognitive parts of our brain, uh, even the ones that are our, our subjectivity. Um, and it's one of the things I think we don't normally teach our students to, to do um, uh, very well, but, but, but it is something that, that, that I think about. I then did a series of drawings that I call the moon dome styles. They're all based on my tribe's moon calendar. There are 13 moons. Uh, many indigenous cultures have um, this, the, these calendars, um, they're based on the new moon and usually they're named after something that's happening in the environment. Um, and so again, I was I was using um, non-humans as the, the kind of scale figures. And this one is called the thunder moon. Um, it would need an apparatus on the top of it. What have, what if the first clap of thunder actually happened while I was sleeping uh, and I needed to, to, to be awoken by that. Uh, and the apparatus itself is like a deer's ear because a deer is largely prey. Uh, it has to hear its predators. Um, and so I that's why I put it into this into this um, drawing. When I'm drawing these things, um, I, I started to do this uh, in 2003 when I was the artist in residence, uh, when I was drawing things that I was trying to draw my, my tribe's uh, uh, creation story. Um, I stopped erasing things in my sketchbook. I stopped erasing um, anything. Uh, I didn't start over. I didn't turn the page. I just kept drawing over these things. And that's how I uh, came at this sort of layered approach to, to drawing. Um, and each one of these are, uh, I'm just looking at different things, the ways that you get into the structure. What if the structure itself was different? What if it didn't have columns? In this case, what if it was just a bundle of sticks? Uh, what if humans weren't uh, involved in this at all? The bears pulling out this sort of irrigation um, uh, uh, device that, that irrigates its landscape and the top catches, catches rainwater. Um, and so, and then I started to um, render differently. Um, so I was making these rhino models while I was, when I was doing the drawings, originally just did it so that I was casting shadows correctly when I watercolored them. But then I started to think, what if I started to render differently? What if I changed the, the camera view from being that sort of standard human eye level? What if it was at the eye level of a wolf? What if the structure of this thing was like organic and structural hair like a porcupine's quills uh what if there was just so much of it that that it actually held this thing up uh and what if the wolf could see things in the sky that i can't see as a human we know that birds can see things that that we can't see right birds can see magnetism so they fly towards it and they fly away from it but what if the wolf can see things in in, in the sky that i can't see um so i was thinking about rendering these possibilities as rendering these things um visible uh in in the work in 2018, I did this installation. It was part of a, a, a residency at the um, um, uh, Bookworm Gardens. It's a children's literature garden in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, just north of, of Milwaukee. And so I wanted to explore this idea of the trickster in indigenous storytelling. And the trickster is usually usually an animal, sometimes it's some other sort of phenomena, but the animal does things um, to teach us about our own humanity, um, teach us things about greed, uh, vanity, gluttony, those kinds of things. It might eat too much, it might hunt uh, things it's not supposed to hunt, it might think that it's things uh, that, that it's not, for my people, that it's a fox. Um, and so the structure itself it doesn't uh, really follow any sort of form. It doesn't have a program because it's in this ch children's literature garden. I wanted children to see it and then start to tell their own stories about it. Um, and, and I happened on a, a young woman while I was making the thing. She didn't know I was the person that was making it. And I asked her what she thought about it. She said, well, it looks like it's from a movie that I don't know about yet, or it's something that, that, animals made and then people came later and I was like that's exactly right that's exactly what you should be doing uh with this thing and so um I made it from trees that were harvested from from the garden um I used the same exact copper mesh on the on the piece that I was using on the smaller models um earlier and it's really a sort of, sort of impromptu structure and I'm really just thinking about simple structural principles here um uh, similar to how indigenous people uh in the Great Plains had made teepees where you loosely tie together three trees and then you walk Walk those trees up and then you um, start to um, uh, tie them together. But I also started to think about this idea that um, why can't architecture have regalia too? 
and thinking about the role of regalia in indigenous culture. Um, it's not just aesthetic uh, and it's not just ornamental. It actually tells us things about who, who you are, where you came from, what you may have accomplished. And so on the right is a, a headdress of a, of a Mohawk uh, male. Uh, I know that it's Mohawk because it has three feathers up. It's The Mohawk are part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. My people, the Oneida, are also part of that confederacy. Um, if it had two feathers up and one feather down, I, then I would know it's Oneida. Um, it has antlers, so the, I know that it's a chief. Um, the chiefs are elected. Um, it is a sort of democratic republic that we had. Um, you can look this up. The U.S. Constitution is largely plagiarized from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, it is the longest running democracy in the world ever, uh, still, still running today. But I started to think about what if architecture could have similar regalia. So when I was making these models, I would put these things on it. And so when I made the, the trickster, the full scale one, I, I, I did a similar thing. So the one that I made is loosely based on this model. And I also started to think about the role of drawings, models, buildings and or structures in architecture and how we're taught about that as being a kind of linear process, right? We we think of the thing and then we represent the thing through drawings uh, and those drawings are intended to hand off to someone else. We might make a model that is also a scalar sort of representation of the thing. Um, and then the building is supposed to be the, the same thing. But what if there was a real dialogue between those things? And I didn't do a set of drawings for, for the trickster. Um, and I didn't make a model of it before I made it. I just made it. Um, and so I was really thinking about the uh, dialogue between all of those things, the drawings, models, and, and um, structures uh, when I made that trickster. In uh, 2021, I was asked to do a permanent land acknowledgement um, for Lawrence University, a small liberal arts college in Wisconsin. They wanted to acknowledge the fact that their uh, campus is on Menominee land. Uh, the Menominee are uh, indigenous to the state of Wisconsin, um, and it's called Otachia or Crane, which in the Menominee language is, uh, it means Crane, and the Crane is part of their clan structure. Uh, the Crane is in charge of architecture and art. Uh, it's one of the few sort of uh, um, instances that I know of uh, where a clan is in charge of, of, of art and architecture, um, and that is their, their responsibility. So this is the land base, uh, original land base of, of the nominee in the state. Um, and so uh, we can see it's a very large portion of the state. It's kind of hard to see. If you look at a satellite photo of, of Wisconsin, you'll, you'll see this sort of rectangle. Um, it looks like a Photoshop or a glitch. Um, that is the, the boundary of, uh, of the Menominee Reservation. They have always sustainably harvested that land. Uh, over the past 100 years, they have increased the yield of that land from 125 to 140%. Um, they only take trees down uh, when they're too old or they're shading. They, they have a very um, strict sort of forestry um, um, plan. Um, and uh, Lawrence University is, is located kind of right in the middle of that. And so they were wanted to acknowledge the fact that their campus is, is on, that, on that land. The thing that was also important to me is I uh, engaged the indigenous students at, at the university. Um, these are students that are not just from Wisconsin, they're from all over the country. Um, Lawrence University has a uh, program called College Horizons where they bring indigenous students to the campus and they basically talk about what it means to go to college as an indigenous person. And one of the things that really struck me about their um, presence and how they thought about their, themselves in the university was they don't see anything that is indigenous. They don't see anything that re uh, represents them. They don't have places to go that, um, that they can uh, begin to identify with. And so this, this piece uh, is something that you can get into. Uh, it's in a sort of major thoroughfare of, of the university right next to the library um, and students um, use it and have used it as a place of gathering, a place of protest. It is a thing that now they can can identify with. Um, and so all Indigenous students that, that, that come there um, are in, intended to sort of engage with, with the piece. It has a geometric pattern that is uh, from the Menominee, uh, um, similar to uh, uh, their their artwork um, and uh, the custom perforation of, of the piece. And like I said, you can get inside it, um, and it, it is a thing to begin to, to reflect on on that landscape. I was asked to, um, as one of five designers, to uh, contribute to this exhibition at the Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, the, the exhibition is called Architecture at Home, and each one of us were, were funded to build a full-scale prototype of housing. And I wanted to address indigenous housing in general. Um, this is the HUD house that I grew up in uh, on my reservation. Um, I can identify myself to anyone that's from my reservation. They'll know what I mean when I say I grew up in site one. 
uh, which is how we identified ourselves. Um, if you grew up in site two, we kind of know where that is as, as well. But this is this is the Google Street View, the current Google Street View. It's a little bit of an improved sort of um, um, home uh, than, than what I grew up in. So I went to high school uh, nine miles away. And what I saw in my non-Indigenous friends' neighborhoods, I saw that their houses were close together. They had sidewalks, they had trees, they had garages. We didn't have a garage. Uh, we didn't have a porch. Uh, we didn't have a sidewalk. There are no trees on, on the outside of that. So there was this sort of way of seeing the world that I think started to shape me as a designer and an architect um, that I saw that there was a sort of fundamental lack of care with these with these things, uh, meaning the house and, and how they work. Um, and this is an image that one of my uh, students from Yale uh, produced in the studio that I that I taught that semester in spring 21. We're working in the the, the top right image in that community, the Opisquia Cree Nation in Manitoba. But I was explaining to the students that this house, the exact same house that I grew up in, uh, is deployed all over the U.S. in the Southwest, in the Great Plains, and in Canada. Has doesn't reflect the people, doesn't reflect the environment, doesn't reflect uh, reflect the landscape. And when I say it's the same house, the floor plan is almost exactly the same. And so the one that I grew up in uh, in Wisconsin um, looked like this. This is a floor plan from a house in South Dakota. And I will tell you, it's almost exactly the same floor plan of the house that I grew up in. Um, I would say that this one is a bit of a fancier version because it has a master bath and a, and a regular bath. We only had one bath in our three bedroom home. But there. But my response to this was that I wanted to make the thing that is not my HUD house, uh, is not this thing. Uh, my HUD house didn't have a porch. My HUD house didn't have a place for a fire, didn't have a view to the sky, didn't have a place for my non-human relatives, didn't have a place for me to do my homework. It had a living room, a bedroom, and a kitchen. Um, in thinking about indigenous space, um, I was thinking about how we, if we didn't have these kinds of spaces, right, like a bedroom, a, a living room, kitchen, what if we had open spaces, spaces of, of production, culture, ritual, diplomacy, that's what um, indigenous dwellings actually were. And what if our non-human relatives could also be uh, housed in these things? What if I was making habitats for, for them uh, as, as well? And so I created these renderings um, that, that show a bear and a wolf um, coming up to coming up to the the house um, and then this is the the prototype that was built and we uh, installed it in August of, of 21 uh, I think it's going to be deinstalled sometime next month but um, but I was thinking about this as a modular thing as well that the housing didn't reflect how we lived uh, at, on our reservations um, in many cases you might have multiple generations living in a home you might have adult children who have children for a period of time my grandmother lived with us I slept on the couch she slept in my bedroom so families can expect they can contract. And what if we we built these in modules where we could add a bedroom or we could take a bedroom off or we could have uh, uh, basically what is an accessory dwelling unit where my grandmother could live? Because on reservations, we don't need property lines because the, the connection of land ownership is in the collective. It's in the people own the land. And so when you own a home on the reservation, you only own the structure and you're leasing uh, leasing the land. But what would that do to the, the shapes of these homes and what would it do to the ways that, that we begin to, to live? Um, so this one, instead of, uh, I didn't have the budget to build a sort of big masonry hearth. So I built this big steel frame to stand in the place of that hearth. But the idea that that is the place of fire and that fire is a place of council it might be a place of cooking uh it, it might be a place of ceremony um and and all of that that happens uh with within within the home and so this house has the the regalia of of my culture on it my hud house did not have those things um and and beginning to think about how how that actually works these are jingles um that are on indigenous women's dresses so it's it's kind of a um Pan Indian culture at this at this point, but uh, but it is uh, intended to begin to signal um, your dancing and, and walking. Um, so they're usually um, sewn onto a dress, uh, closely packed together, and and they make a noise uh, when uh, when uh, women are when are dancing. On the inside, I'm trying to bring in light uh, in different places. My hut house didn't have any light on the inside, uh, and it didn't have a view to the sky. And this one does, so I'm bringing light in high and low. And so this idea of the the view to the sky is usually coupled with the fire or with the place of, of ceremony. Uh, and I'm just trying to tap into those things within indigenous architecture. So these are images, historical images of, of architecture all 
over the country. Uh, my people are in the lower right there. That's a, um, uh, a Haudenosaunee longhouse, and it has a hole in it uh, for where the smoke comes out. Um, th this is a term that I wish I had invented, but it's indigenuity. This idea that um, indigenous people were really highly sophisticated um, uh, builders, but they had spaces that you could have a fire in and, and let smoke out of. So uh, my, my house has that as, as well. And uh, thinking about um, my non-human relatives, uh, we did this rendering um, early before the project was built, put this deer on the porch, and there's a snow owl in the hearth um, looking for its prey. Um, but one morning when I came to the site uh, during the installation, I saw these deer tracks um, that were walking right up to, and they disappear. So that means that the deer either went into the house, would definitely went on the porch, but it wasn't afraid of the thing. And someone else sent me an Instagram video of, of deer uh, walking up to the thing. And that way, for me, it confirms that I'm trying to be a good relative um, to this this thing, right? Um, it, the, the sort of little ledges on, on the openings were there for, for birds to, to think about uh, nesting in. And the last uh, piece I want to show you is a, a guidaze, uh, which means stranger in Oneida. Um, I'm, uh, this will be opening at uh, the Chicago Architecture Biennial on Wednesday, um, is currently being installed uh, as we speak. But um, I wanted to approach the idea of land acknowledgement slightly differently because I've been asked to do these things in, in other communities. And, and in Chicago, I didn't want to say something very specific about the indigenous land there. I wanted to say something about the fact that I'm indigenous and I'm a stranger in that land too. Um, I'm a visitor. Um, I'm not, I don't have some sort of like secret knowledge about, about indigeneity. Um, so that's one aspect of it. And so uh, that's why it's called um, the stranger. The other part of it is this uh, idea within indigenous knowledge, uh, epistemology, ontology, that um, we have things in our culture, uh, visions, dreams, stories that are regarded as truth. That is part of our, our knowledge system. They're not fantasy. They're not fables. Um, they're truth. And so one of these truths is um, demonstrated in this, this image from um, the show Reservation Dogs, if you've seen it on Hulu. In the first season, um, they introduced the story of the deer woman. I happened to, a few weeks before this, this actually aired, I happened to have a discussion um, with Edgar Hippa Birds, who is an indigenous artist. I said, do you have things in your community, stories in, within your community um, that you don't normally share with other people you might share with other indigenous people and he said yes there's the deer woman the deer woman uh appears as a very attractive woman um and she attracts bad men um and once she attracts these bad men they're never seen again right so it's implied that this is uh the consequences of 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 being a bad man uh in the show we see the attractive woman but when she gets in the car that's when we see the feet um of the deer um, and so in indigenous knowledge, I believe that to be absolutely true. I have a story about this in my community. I won't share it, but, um, but I believed it to be true. I never saw it. I just believed that it was, was there. And so this piece is intended to do some of that, um, that the feet of a deer can be on a woman. And that is true, right? Um, that this piece is not only a structure, but it is an animal. What if it was more like an animal? So I've cut it into these three pieces, um, the haunch, the tail, and the, and the carapace. Um, it will be have cladding of, of deer hides on, on one portion of it. Um, it will have more jingles than than the not my HUD house had. And then the carapace part will have a sort of different paint finish on the inside that's intended to be like the turtle shell. Um, also on the, on the inside, um, this chimney, uh, which I can't literally have a view to the sky. It's going to be one of the sort of big gallery spaces and um, exhibition spaces in the Chicago Cultural Center. Uh, but it will have a screen that has recordings of the sky in New Mexico. It's one of the things uh, where I live uh, that is just so striking and amazing. The sky there is is amazing. And so um, it's one of the things that are my way of bringing the view to the sky. And so it's broken, in, like I said, into these three pieces, a part that has uh, has fur, a part that has these jingles, and, and part, is, uh, part of this is the shell. And so just like a thing can be a deer and a woman, uh, it can be an animal and a building. It's scaled 
so that it's not quite to full scale. Uh, it's bigger than a model. It's smaller than a building. People can get into it, but maybe not not so much um, comfortably. And you can see here the chimney, uh, which has the screen that that uh, we can see uh, we can see the sky. And so for me, I'm trying to think about architecture uh, and and, and it, seeing it as one of my relatives and beginning to think about how we really um, sort of sort of mean that. Um, and can architecture have this sort of um, state of, of being that it ties into indigenous knowledge uh, and uh, architecture for indigenous people. Uh, Yawako, thank you. Thank you, Chris. We have one last speaker who will be joining us online. All right. A.M. Ken Geyser is a geographer and sound artist. They are a Marie Curie Research Fellow in Geohumanities at Royal Holloway University of London. Their current projects amplify movements for self-determination in the face of ongoing colonization through research extraction, environmental racism, and ecological disaster in Oceania. They are author of Experimental Politics in the Making of Worlds, and between sound and silence, listening toward environmental relations, there, which is a forthcoming text. Their audio work has been commissioned by Documenta, 14 Radio, BBC Radio, ABC Radio National, the Natural History Museum London, and Deutschland Radio, amongst many others. Please join me in welcoming A.M. Keng Kengeser. Uh, hi, um, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm coming to you quite late at night where I am in the UK. So you might have to bear with me as a, I might be a little bit slow, but um, yeah, it's been really interesting listening to the talks tonight. And, you know, I think similarly to Simone made a comment about being a bit of an interloper um, into the discipline. So I am, I suppose, architecture adjacent as a geographer. Um, and when I was invited to come and speak, I was invited to come and speak specifically around the ethics of encountering the Anthropocene um, and uh, the long engagement, I suppose, with the ideas of the Anthropocene uh, and case studies, particularly from a geographical perspective. So that is what I will be talking about. Um, so I'll just begin with a little story to kind of give some context to the work that I do. Uh, in 2018, I was invited to visit. The AM, is your microphone on or are you muted? No, my microphone's on. It's on. Can can you not hear me? Hello? My microphone is working from my side. Hi now. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cause it's working on my side. Um, so did you hear any of that? No, we did not. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Um, well, I'll just recap it very quickly. Um, I was just saying that, um, so I am adjacent to architecture as a geographer. Um, and I was invited to come and speak to you about the ethics of encountering the Anthropocene um, and the ideas of the Anthropocene, I suppose, suppose as held in geography uh, in thinking about um, engagements with the Anthropocene through case studies. And so I wanted to just begin my talk with a little bit of a, a, a story about how I came to do the work that I am going to be talking about today and the work that I've been doing for quite a while. Um, and so the first image here is of the island of Kiribati in the Pacific. And I was invited to Kiribati in 2018 to visit um, to visit communities there. And Kiribati, for 
I'm assuming a lot of you don't know, is located around about a thousand miles from Hawaii. Um, a big ocean state, Kiribati holds a land mass of around 315 square miles, but an oceanic economic zone of 1,328,890 square miles. Tarawa, which is the island that you see here in this image, is the most inhabited of the islands, and it peaks at around about three metres above sea level. I went to Kiribati in part to meet with Dr. Teveriki Tiero, who was a renowned scholar, poet, and educator, who had directed the Oceania Centre at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji for many years, before returning to his homeland, where at the time he'd been planning on running for government. Teviariki spoke with me at great length about the status of Kiribati as one of the already most critically affected frontline nations. And when I was speaking to him, I asked him what was a lesson for non-Pacific Islanders to learn about understanding everyday life there. And he said to me, two ears, one mouth, don't talk too much, learn to listen more, not only to hear, but to be able to develop another thing, and that is to be able to interpret these things are different, they occur at different levels, the hearing and the interpretation of the sound, it's very much part of our world. So I wanted to begin with this invitation from Tevi Ariki, um, who has now sadly passed, to listen because it's widely emerging as a methodological concern in approaches to understanding our continuing planetary existence. In her book, Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals, Alexis Pauline Gums asks, and I quote, how can we listen across species, across extinction, across harm? And I think this ties in really nicely to what Chris has just been talking about. Um, the question posed by Gums is one that many of us are already actively grappling with, the catastrophes of climate crisis, expressions of the colonial capitalist violences of white supremacy are multiplying rapidly and the urgency to do something sits in tension with a lack of knowing what to do and how. While disciplines invested in tech are trying to forge ahead through ostensibly sustainable and green solutions, the arts are trying to communicate what is oftentimes barely comprehensible, let alone easily distilled. It is apparent that the more interdependent orientations are needed, which foreground how people and communities relate to the earth as a part of the earth. So in my work as an interdisciplinary sound artist, geographer and writer, I develop practices of listening and attunement to approach the relations between people, places and ecologies. My training as a geographer informs how I come to the sonic field because I'm interested in deconstructing what it means to listen to and make sense of and translate the sounds of environmental and human entanglements through the assumption of an Anglo-European ontoepistemological lens. A crucial aspect of what I do is situating how I listen as a white uh, European Australian and how I inhabit place as a settler colonizer. My work is grounded in a commitment to finding ways to be in what uh, Métis Professor Zoe Todd, who I work with, calls good relations with where I am, and most crucially, knowing the boundaries around this and what it means for how I comport myself in the communities that I collaborate with. So for the past several years, um, I have been speaking with communities, so I'm just going to check the Okay, you can hear me on Zoom, good. Um, for the past several years, I've been speaking with communities about the impacts of the climate crisis in the Pacific and examining how European colonization through resource capitalism and environmental racism exacerbates these. My orientation in this is toward the everyday ways that communities determine their own practices of liberation and care within and despite ecocide. In my work with communities on climatic crisis and survival, I prioritize listening to contested and difficult environments with sensitivity. This listening doesn't just mean the physiological and psychological process of hearing, it's listening also to the silences of expression by people in environments and attempting to understand how to interpret these appropriately across local and global contexts. So briefly, what I want to emphasize in the talk that I'm giving to you um, today, well, tonight for me, um, is how over the years, um, my collaborators and I have slowly and very carefully implemented what we've been told, particularly um, in putting this into the space of artistic production. So I'm going to be focusing on our upcoming large-scale audiovisual installation, Oceanic Refractions, which is co-produced with Fijian artist Marinala Tikal. And this piece is launching in January 2024, uh, 2024 next year in Berlin across two long-standing European art and media festivals, Transmediale and CTM. 
So oceanic refractions emerges from years of consultation, preparation, and consideration of what it means to ethically share frontline stories to audiences with different ways of knowing and being. Oceanic Refractions has its foundations in a longer-term project, Climates of Listening, which I began in 2015, working with predominantly Pacific women, queer and transgender artists, organizers, and scholars to amplify movements for self-determination and liberation in the face of resource extraction, environmental racism, and ecological disaster. The Pacific region is susceptible to a number of devastating changes, including sea level rise, erosion, intensifying drought, floods, earthquakes, cyclones, and tsunamis. Along with intersecting challenges such as economic development, health epidemics, and under and unemployment, nations of the Pacific, like other small island developing states, are held up as case studies for vulnerability. Through this lens of vulnerability, the sea of islands that Pacific poet and educator Epeli Haofa spoke about becomes reduced to the limited perspective of what he calls islands in a far sea, which emphasizes remoteness and marginality over self-determination and autonomy. To counter the narrow definitions of resilience and vulnerability that the region tends to get pushed into through government policy and NGO discourses, the project seeks to showcase the nuanced and variegated ways that people understand, produce knowledge about, and collectively attend to their lived experiences of ecocide. So prior to Oceanic Refractions um, were a number of audio and audiovisual commissions, including this year's Listening Across Fault Lines, which was a long form three-part radio series for Deutschland Radio, and Crenulation's Pacific Drift, an installation created in partnership with um, audio and technology company Bang Analofsen for the Struer Tracks Biennial in Denmark. Both of these works curated over 30 quotes from extensive ethnographic interviews with community elders and advisors, bishop people, scholars, cultural ministers, and chiefs. They focused on the, uh, the testimonies of Professor Una Isi Nambombombaba, Dr. Tevieri Kitiero, Philip Takom, Lydia Jacob, and Simeone Sevundrere from Kiribati, Papua New Guinea, and Fiji on the themes of sound, silence, and environmental relations. The thematic of listening and silence was substantially influenced by a book written by Professor Nabombombaba in which she outlines a typology of silence in indigenous Fijian or Itauke knowledge systems, which allows for what she calls a pedagogy of deep engagement. Ideas and practices of listening as an Anglo-European construct were not adequate to encompass the vast meanings of listening as held by Pacific cultures. And I want to play a, a short um, piece here from Simeone Samandredre where he talks about this explicitly. I remember seeing in some print the listening, the indigenous way of listening is uh, similar to how a psychologist listens. The listening is not only for the vocabulary and the intent, the subtext, the tone, the intensity, all these are taken into account and analyzed. So we not only listen, we hear. What do we hear? We hear the said and the unsaid. So this is how relationships are very important in, in, in indigenous Itoki society. When the living people are in harmony, the land and the sea will, uh, will reflect that because they are an extension of us, we are an extension of them. I remember So rather than reconstruct conventional frontline narratives, it was important for us to uh, reorientate away from what Eve Tuck calls damage-centered research, research that submerges the context of colonization and racism to local deficits, to locate deficits within minoritized communities, rather than in the processes those communities are forced to endure. By emphasizing Pacific cultural approaches that prioritize intergenerational knowledge of land and environments through listening, we acted on the interviewee's guidance to turn toward relations and care. So throughout our process, we consulted with our advisory board of Pacific elders and community members who underscored that sensory engagement is endemic to Pacific storytelling, that it is heard, felt, and seen. 
In a paper for Why is Climate Change, Harriet Hawkins, a professor of geography and myself, identified the need for sensorially attuned audiovisual work to address audiences on embodied and experiential registers. Rather than seeking to invoke empathy, oceanic refractions moves towards immersion and resonance an attempt to pay respect to the expression of the ocean as, and I quote, a corporeal and psychic relational vehicle, as Barnabin, E. Kiribas, and African-American anthropologist Katerina Teewa describes it. So this project does this through a number of artistic technologies and techniques. In its largest site-specific iteration, oceanic refractions will be installed to fit the 17 meter high and 202 meter squared silent green Kuppelhalle in Berlin, which is the image that you can see right now. You can see it from the outside and this is the building from the inside as well. So this is a render of the, uh, of the installation and the scale is obviously 17 meters high from floor to ceiling. So we have worked with fabrication and projection specialists Sarah Murphy and Frank Prendergast at Spaceforms and Olin Clark at Algorithm to create 5D immersivity. The installation features two ground level curved screens and the vertical space is hung with two flying screens that you can see there and a flying string curtain onto which underwater videography produced by Fijian filmmakers Dave Lavaki and Meli Takota will be mapped. The projections feature a spacious array of underwater scenes predominantly taken from a diving depth of two to three meters below surface level with a focus on light diffractions to emulate floating underwater looking upward toward the sky. We are also working with olfactory artists to create the oceanic sense choreographed with the audiovisual storyline. The audience are situated on custom built moving seating that mimics the ebb and flow of currents and drift. This movement is intensified through the use of transducers that reverberate with the sound composition. And I want to stay for a moment with the sound composition because this is my area of expertise and I am also um, co-composing the sound. The surround sound multi-channel audio, which is, as I said, composed by myself and musician Joseph Cameru, comprises experts from the testimonies of Una Isina Bombombaba, Tevi Riquitiero, Philip Takom, Lydia Jacob and Simeone Sevandredre, Considering the cultural significance of water, marine subsistence, sea level rise and practices of listening to the ocean. The field recordings featured in this composition come predominantly from the places where the elders we are hearing from reside, and there is an ethical and spiritual importance in keeping the integrity of these sounds and voices in this emplaced relation. And this is explained by Teviriki, which we can hear here. If you look at the environment, at part of the land and everything that surrounds her. In fact, in Gribas, if you look at the language very closely, the word for people and the word for land is the same. We call it Teapa, A-B-A. You can talk to Teapa and you mean land. You can talk about Teapa and you mean people. So there's that very close connection between land and people. If you look at the environment, if you look at, if you look at the environment, if you look at the environment. Sorry about that, got a bit stuck there. Um, the sound recordings and the voices can't be separated because, as Tevi said, um, people's lands and oceans cannot be separated. This ontoepistemology is almost impossible to reconcile with European ways of approaching environmental relations, which always inevitably center the human even when attempting to dissolve this division. Because of this irreconcilability, we are actively working with rather than against the tension and inexperience with unbiased listening. Stolo philosopher Dylan Robinson writes that settler colonizer listening, and I quote, is hungry for the felt confirmations of square pegs in square holes for the satisfactory fit as sound knowledge slides into its appropriate place. Such settler colonizer listening positions constitute, as Robinson puts it, and I quote again, particular assemblages of unmarked structures of certainty that guide normative perception and may enact epistemic violence. By dislocating the hierarchy of voice over environment and playing with non-didactic storytelling, Oceanic Refractions invites audiences into a comportment that may be more suited to approaching Pacific ways of interdependence. So by attending to these different sensorial registers, Oceanic Refraction seeks to create portals for intentional listening. Across the team's extensive experience in community advocacy, environmental and arts research, and regional Pacific governance, we are acutely aware of the challenges in asking audiences to not only listen, but also change behavior. 
A number of existing Pacific-centred climate projects, such as Our Home, Our People and Sea of Islands, even Tuvalu's own metaverse project, are deploying VR and other technologies to preserve memory and compel empathy. There are enormous impediments to systemic change over individual, national and international scales, and it is critical that projects offer audiences pathways towards education. Projects that work closely with communities are best equipped for clarifying community needs. Fundamentally, for oceanic refractions to complete its cycle, the request has been made that it is returned to its homes in the Pacific. There is a stated desire that the work is accessible to use as a teaching resource for school curricula, and there have also been requests to store interviews, recordings, and transcriptions in local and national archives that are accessible to community members. As part of the listening work of the project, we have drawn together a collective philosophy influenced by Pacific research protocols, which explicitly lays out the importance of relationships to the longevity of the work. This extends from how the material is gathered and disseminated to who is cited and how, to how money is distributed and circulated to cultures of communication and respect for differing needs. So as I've outlined here and to bring this to a close, the larger project of Oceanic Refractions is founded on ethics of care, relationality and interdependence that incorporates humans and ecosystems beyond Anglo-European worldviews. This is a material shift that is relevant to projects and disciplines intent on cultivating respectful relations for anti-colonial, social and environmental liberation. Thank you. All right, does anyone have a question to start us off? Oh. I'm going to run the microphone back. Um, hi, I have three questions for Simone. They're kind of built on top of each other. I'll be trying to be as brief as I can. Um, so the first is about language. So you talked about uh, how object recognition algorithms has these kind of different categories, um, such as like the difference between iPod and media player. Um, so how much of the kind of the errors uh, we're seeing in the case of the chairs are contributed by the limits of the language? And then second questions kind of build on top of that is like the, the matter of context. So with those chairs that are shown without background, they're kind of floating objects. And like, um, so how would multimodal uh, inputs uh, such as image to image or video to 3D uh, will contribute or improve the algorithm's understanding of the context? And the third one is something that you haven't talked about as much as a matter of user agency. I was thinking about like the diagram between the cup and the bowl and, and something similar, such as like a, a, a glass uh, used for drinking water. When it's, when it's tall enough, at some point, it can be used as a bus. So what kind of situation would enable users to make different decisions about what the object is used for? This is, yeah, uh, thank you for these questions. Um, I think the first one on language, I mean, it's also important to point out that at least um, the specific data set that I showed, but also otherwise, the ones I have access to are in English. Um, that doesn't mean that there's no others. Um, it's also my own limitation, as in my mother tongue will be Swiss German. There's definitely none because it's not a written language. Um, German, but there's none that I'm aware of. Um, so I think first of all, it's sort of my level of accessibility in terms of just being able to like type stuff and like find things. Um, but I think a similar uh, situation is reflected in at least the, the data sets that I see where um, the research communities often also are multilingual, right? But English becomes a little bit of a default um, in terms of how these objects are labeled. Um, and yeah, that is a very limited source of knowledge to that effect. I mean, uh, you know, different as we've seen in the other presentations, I mean, there's many different ways of interacting, calling, um, uh, you know, naming the world. Um, and so I think one of the really obvious questions, I'm sort of obsessed with this object of the chair. Um, and, you know, I'm curious there, like, is, are we talking about something to sit on, but then why isn't the carpet also part of that data set? And, you know, 
I think to some extent, um, it's negotiations that we have on a human level um, that's that's deeply part of language and communication um, that to a large extent is removed um, in technological systems. And I think some of it to also your other questions, um, the, the image of the shark, um, it's not always so much about improving the system, perhaps. It's also about being aware of its limits. Um, so I think, you know, Yes, the Roomba can be fed with more and different kinds of languages with different typologies of a bed, um, but will it ever encapsulate sort of the vastness um, of a lived experience, the vastness of like different cultures, DIY, do we even, we, I guess there's only this sort of very general we, but is that even an, a sort of a uh, solution um, that is something to strive forwards? Um, I personally would think no, um, it's much more interesting to have um, tools that are incredibly specific, uh, being aware of their limitations and being able to um, use them to their abilities in, in whatever space necessary, rather than trying to solve all. Um, and at least as a designer, I think that's always a little bit of a, a strange position because it's sort of, well, now make it better, right? Um, sort of you, you've identified the design problem um, and now go and make a solution. And I think at least my own position is so much more always as in, well, I just have tons of questions and I don't know how this works. I mean, let's start there. Um, and then sort of through realizing and annotating and, and sort of understanding how something might've become what it is, um, being able to figure out its application. But yeah, thank you. Another question? My questions are always coming as the mic goes closer. Um, such beautiful presentations. I can't thank each of you all enough. Absolutely powerful. And what I'm thinking about in all your presentations is how through your work, you're showing us the intelligence of humans in that you all are able to bring together histories, um, fables and folklores, sound in ways that uh, technology, mm, the trope of technology is distilling, abstracting, and separating these things to understand them. But in all your works, you're showing how we as humans understand these things deeply in ways that technology cannot, or how we think about discretizing things in technology. Um, and so with that in my mind and your very grounded ways of acknowledging humanity, the environment and its knowledges, what are your approaches, positions, not position is a strong word, approaches or thinking when it comes to uh, in our field of computational design, technology, what are your approaches to how you think through, think with, and use technology in your projects? At least for me, I think that, you know, one of the things that, at least from my understanding, my own cultural understanding that I tried to share is that we never saw humans at the top of the pyramid, let's say, right? <laughs> that humans did not have dominion over nature as explained in the book of Genesis, that that's not how we saw these things, but we saw this as in relation to one another. Um, I just personally believe that technology is within that, right? Like it's about responsibility as being a good relative and how can I technologically be a good, good relative as well. I know that there are, are people indigenous people working in the gaming industry now right like this is this is a way of how do we explain these these cultural aspects of 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 what we do um when i taught the studio at yale too i had one student he was really interested in in gaming engines and gaming technology and i just asked him like can you because we were working in this community the studio was spring 21 so it was virtual we couldn't actually go to this community we had to engage them through this sort of digital interface but i said you know knowing seeing virtually the terrain through google earth and the place and 
understanding of that. Can you show me how a wolf will see this landscape, how a deer will see this landscape, and how a muskrat will see this landscape? And he did it. He did it with the with the with the gaming engine because then he could begin to understand from that point of view how those things actually worked. Um, and I think it's really just about for indigenous people, it's really about understanding that Western knowledge had tried to dis almost dismiss everything else and say, no, this is the way of thinking about, th these are the valuable sets of knowledge and this is how we see the world. For me, as, as someone trained as an architect and educated as an architect, I was always like drawing these parallels between what I was learning and what my culture was because I never saw anything indigenous that, that those things weren't, weren't presented to me. Um, I certainly am trying to change that. I did in the University of New Mexico, we had do that and they have always done that. And that's kind of why I went there. But but it's really about understanding that that sort of relationship. But I do think that we should be thinking about the responsibilities we have um, in being good relatives. And are we using technology to uh, to separate people, which is what colonization is is fueled by, is creating this sort of radical otherness. But are we are or are we trying to be inclusive, right? And and understanding uh, the limits of of technology and understanding where we can actually leverage it uh, to begin to think about uh, other things. And for me, it's thinking about domesticity, even like how I grew up was like it's similar to the technology in a way that it's like making these containers. I'm supposed to sleep in this place. I'm supposed to eat in this place, and I'm supposed to relax in this place. Um, and I can't do the other things and anywhere else, right? Like I can't do these other things. When where I grew up, everyone was hacking their house, right? Everyone's hacking their home to like, how am I going to do my homework if I, I where am I supposed to do that? That you know, if there's no space to do that. Someone just briefly, someone told me the story of um, uh, it, housing, indigenous housing that they had engaged in uh, in the Great Plains. Um, they they saw this house and it had a huge hole in it that went into the into the bathroom. And they're like, "Why is there? How how are you living like this? Why is that?" hole there and and the guy said well how else is my horse supposed to drink the horse walks up to the house puts his head through the hole and he can drink out of the bathtub uh that's that's how things were working so people were adjusting right people were adjusting the landscape and what i'm advocating for is for us to begin to think about um how can we make better suited environments for uh fostering culture and and connection um, but I do also think that certainly I, you know, I have colleagues that are working in, in the realm of technology and uh, I have an artist friend that does, um, she does a lot of AR work and uh, in parks and uh, engaging so that thinking about indigenous stories uh, seen through the lens of, of technology is not a foreign thing, right? It's not, not, not something that is, is displacing that, that activity and way of knowing and understanding. Uh, it's actually just helping really augment it. Yeah. Am do you want to take that question too? Yeah. Um. Thanks for such a wonderful, generous question. Um. I can't see you. Uh. But thank you very much. I think it's a really interesting question. You know. Um. Especially thinking about again, like as I said at the beginning, you know, I come at this as a geographer and as a social scientist. So I am not an architect. So the kinds of questions that concern me are about the material histories of technologies as well, you know, and obviously I'm thinking as well of what is currently happening in the world and the way that different technologies come out of military R&D. You know, a lot of sound technologies that I am using have a very brutal and violent history, particularly in engagement with Indigenous communities like sound and recording technologies, you know, come out of military R&D and have been used in ethnography, in, in anthropology, in disciplines to, you know, uh, create particular kinds of knowledge and to, I suppose, um, render particular kinds of knowledge knowable and authentic in particular kinds of ways. So when I'm using technologies in my work, I'm always thinking about what are the histories of the technologies that I'm using and what do they carry with them? 
you know, what, what do they communicate with them? You know, obviously, if you're working with sound technologies and recording technologies, there are very big differences between using technologies with people with, uh, you know, with permission and with consent, and also things like eavesdropping and surveillance and things like that. So those are concerns that always sit with me when I think about the technologies that I'm using within this work. Another thing that I really do need to comment on as well, you know, particularly in working across the Pacific, that what is the access to technology of the people that I'm working with? In a lot of the places that I work, there is very limited internet access. You know, internet is hard to come by and it's extraordinarily expensive. So even when thinking about, you know, making things like websites or, or you know, putting audio online and things like that, who is actually going to be able to access it? How is it going to speak to the audiences that I am I'm speaking to and I'm working with? How is it actually going to be engaged with by the communities that I'm working with? And I think one of the things I've been thinking a lot about recently, and it, it's probably, you know, something that not many people are aware of is, like I mentioned, um, like I mentioned in my talk, the situation of the island nation of Tuvalu making a version of itself in the metaverse. And if you think about what that actually means, Tuvalu is one of the lowest lying island nations in the Pacific. And along with Kiribati is probably the most at risk and under threat island in the Pacific due to rising sea levels. So Tuvalu has decided that because the land is very likely very soon to no longer exist, that they will make an iteration of themselves in the metaverse to be able to, you know, keep tradition and culture alive in that kind of aspect. And I think, you know, something like that, that's that's far too big for me to be able to speak on, you know, like the, the, the tragedy, the absolute tragedy and the absolute violence of a situation like that coming to pass imminently, you know, is something where we do have to think about, you know, like, yes, there is absolutely fundamentally a role for technology there and a fantastic role as well. But at the same time, you know, practices like deep seabed mining, which are necessary and, and different kinds of different forms of terrestrial mining, which are necessary in order to create like and get the material resources and parts to create the technologies that we often take for granted you know, also contributing to the environmental and ecological destruction that are then, you know, causing places like Tuvalu to make iterations of themselves in the metaverse to be able to continue into the future. So I think for me personally, the questions of technologies and the kinds of technologies that we use are really complicated ones. Yeah. All right. I hate to cut off this conversation, but unfortunately we have to. I think that we've been left with some really beautiful and urgent thoughts about the the future of technology. So if we could give everybody a big round of applause. Yeah.